the same yesterday, today and forever. Why don't we just prepare our hearts and just ask him to speak to us this morning. Father, we thank you for the powerful words that we just read, reminders of who you are, reminders of what you've done in, through your creation in laying the foundations of the earth, including making each one of us. And we invite you now to speak to every person here through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says God has set eternity in the human heart. This means he's put deep within us a tug, a true longing for more than just the here and now. You and I were made for eternity and so we're starting this brand new series called Who Are You Listening To? Because often we can be distracted from that, that message, can't we? Because there's so many messages coming at us. So many messages competing for our attention, vying for our focus and our loyalty. Other messages we let sink deep into our hearts and minds, actually helping us live a life of purpose. Maybe you didn't even know that you were made for a purpose, that there is more to this life than what we see in the here and now. Are they grounding our lives on what is true, wise and eternal? Or are they distracting us away from what is timeless? Who are we listening to? And I want you to take a look at this uh, infographic. This is what happens in an internet minute. (laughs) Now some of the stats on there are for US only. So the online spend, streaming music, the search queries and texting is for US only. But the rest is global. There's one million people logging on to Facebook every minute. There's 4.5 million YouTube videos viewed every minute. There's 390,030 apps downloaded every minute. There's 347,222 people scrolling Instagram every minute. 188 million (laughs) emails sent. 4.8 4.8 million gifts served. If you don't know what a gift is, ask a young person. 87,500 people tweeting. Talk about information overload. It's coming at us all the time, all the time, all the time, these messages. And without con- continually listening for God's voice and God's message to us, we have trouble separating what is of little value from what's important. Sometimes we do. We begin to build our lives on what's trending or what's popular instead of what's timeless and what's timeless. And so, Chloe, thank you this morning for reminding us that God's word and his promises are timeless. It's not just for the kids, it's for all of us. Have a look at these. Some of the most popular toys over the last 50 years. You might have had one or owned one. In the 1920s, it was the Radio Flyer Wagon. A chemistry set <clears throat> and a yo yo. In the 1930s, some of you are getting really nostalgic, like, oh, I had one of those. In the 1930s, it was a microscope uh, set. The good old beach ball was around then, and a BB gun, which is not a real gun, but like the cap gun. In the 1940s, bubble solution came along, the slinky and Lego, if you believe it. In the 1950s, matchbox cars, the Tonka truck, and the hula hoop. <laughs> In the 1960s, we had etch, etch, I can't say it, etch a sketch, Barbie and GI Joe. They created GI Joe because they didn't want, they wanted to have a, a doll for boys, but not call it a doll for boys. So they made GI Joe. <laughs> In the 1970s, we had the Star Wars action figures, the Atari 2600, which was the first home video game console with interchangeable cartridges. Who had one? Oh, Lynn Hunter. Come on. The Rubik's Cube and can you believe this? You have to confirm me if this is true, but one of the most popular things that was a bit of a fad in the 70s was a pet rock. (laughs) That is so lame. I'm sorry. 
Like, can't you see through that it's like you're paying money for a rock? You could go and pick it up, but it had this little cardboard box and it was like, you probably named it and all that sort of stuff. Good on you. In the 1980s, it was the Cabbage Patch Kids. Oh, listen to you. Who had a Cabbage Patch Kid? My Little Pony came along in the 80s. The Game Boy was, came out and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is still coming, holding strong, holding strong. Then in the 90s, we had Tickle Me Elmo, the Tamagotchis, Pokemon cards. They're still around today, in my house anyway. Uh, in the 2000s, we had the Razor Scooter, the Nintendo DS, the Xbox 360 and the Zuzu Pets. I mean, technology is just starting to increase here, we get it. And in the 2010s plus, we've had the iPad Frozen Dolls. Who's got a frozen doll in their house? Good on you, sweetheart. Hatchimals and the Nintendo Switch. Look, as a kid growing up, you might have had one of these, you might have had several of these. Maybe one of these is your favourite right now, and toys are fun, right? You might have great memories of times that you spent with your brothers and sisters, your cousins and your friends using these toys, and so we can be grateful to God. Like Rachel said to us this morning, for every good and perfect gift, toys are fun. <laughs> but will they last forever? No. Are they what really matters in life? No. And did you know, kids, there's, there's actually some grown-ups who are still buying and spending money on and wanting and purchasing lots of big grown-up toys as well. It's not just a kid thing. <laughs> Who we listen to matters. The continual messages we allow into our hearts and minds influence us. Do you know one of the saddest verses for me in the whole Bible is Judges 21, 28, where it says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Everyone did as they saw fit. I want to talk to the children and the young people here this morning. You're growing up in a world where there's a lot of messages feeding you a lie. The lie is do what you see fit. Do whatever you feel like doing. Be whoever you choose to be. Because that's the path to happiness and inner fulfilment. That is a lie. And we are committed to praying for you and helping you as your spiritual family ask questions, wrestle with these things, discern what lies in the messages that are coming at you and actually reject them. Because you were made for a great purpose. You cannot discover it by focusing on, your, on yourself. <laughs> you can't discover it by deciding for yourself what really matters. In fact, serving yourself will not bring you lasting happiness. Trying to live independently from God will not bring you lasting peace. It will not bring you lasting hope. It will not help you experience a love that is so great, it is unbreakable. The love that is so wonderful and better than you can imagine that it's worth staking your whole life on. Lasting joy, peace, fulfilment, forgiveness and eternal life can only be found in Jesus. You were never made to choose your own adventure. You know those books where you can choose the ending? You were made to love and serve the King of Kings. He made you for himself and his good purposes. Find lasting joy, peace and fulfilment in who he says you are, in who he has made you to be, in surrendering to his plans for your life, in the identity he bestows on you, he gives you because he lovingly crafted you in your mother's womb, not because you get to choose it. Make doing his will, like we heard this morning, the greatest ambition of your life. Follow Jesus, full stop. Ask for help if you're struggling in how to process some of the things that you're hearing that are just coming at you, coming at you, coming at you, saying it's all about you. It's not all about you. God loves you and he made you 
for there's a greater purpose for your life. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a young man called Timothy. Paul was this crazy God-hater. Well, he thought he was a God-lover, but actually he was a God-hater because he wasn't actually following what God wanted. In fact, he was a Christian hater. And so he went around trying to persecute all these Christians and put them in jail until he had this amazing personal encounter with Jesus. Jesus appeared to him personally, spoke to him, and his life was never the same. And so he just became a follower of Christ too. And wherever he went, he would tell people about Jesus. He was an amazing missionary church planter, preacher. He did amazing miracles in Jesus' name. He wrote a number of the books of, that are part of the New Testament. He was a spiritual father to Timothy. And in 1 Timothy 1, verses 2 to 4, he writes to him, he says, Timothy, I'm sending you this letter. You're my true son in the faith. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy and peace. Timothy, stay here in Ephesus. That's what I told you to do when I went into Macedonia. I I want you to command certain people not to teach things that aren't true. And command them not to spend their time on stories that are made up. They must not waste their time on family histories that never end. These things only lead to fights about ideas. They don't help God's work move forward. His work is done by faith. Do you know, Paul cared a lot about who Timothy was listening to and who the Ephesian church was listening to. (laughs) He didn't want them listening to people who made it sound like they had all the answers when what they were telling others was based on lies. He didn't want them listening to people who were telling myths and fairy tales that were teaching people how and why the world exists, but they were just made up from human ideas. He didn't want them telling people to focus on family histories because somehow who your dad is or who your grandfather is or who your great-grandfather is makes you really impressive to God. Paul says to Timothy, these things only lead to fights about ideas. They're meaningless. Paul knew they didn't help people live for Jesus. They didn't help people be kind to others. They didn't help show others what God is like. And God is not impressed by our efforts to make ourselves look better. (laughs) He knows we can't make ourselves right with him and our human ideas and that's why he's given us the Bible. It's his personal love letter to us. The Bible is God's self-testimony. The words of Scripture are God bearing witness to himself. The Bible points us to God's living word, Jesus. And Jesus is God with us, God who we can see up close and personal, God in the flesh. Jesus shows us what God the Father is like and he came to make a way for us to know God as our heavenly dad and be adopted into his family. He himself is the way to God. He himself have the words that are eternal life. Paul knew this. So he wrote to Timothy and he said, stop telling them to teach things that aren't true. So who are you listening to? Are you listening to things that aren't true? Do you know that they're not true? You might be accessing these messages through your ears, the music you listen to. Might be podcasts that you're listening to. It might be you're really paying attention right now to what your friends are saying and they're saying there isn't there is no God. It might be through people's opinions or gossip. You might be accessing things that aren't true, messages that aren't true through your eyes, through YouTube. So what you're picking up on your social media feeds, through how much and what you're watching on Netflix, through accessing pornographic images online or on your smartphone. 
You might be accessing things that aren't true through your mind, through the blogs that you're reading, through articles and books, or through your heart, what you're spending your time on, what you're spending your money on. what you're meditating on in your heart going over and over and over and over again. You might be focusing on unresolved hurt and so there's all these things in your heart about what the other person did and how much they've hurt you and it starts to distort how you see the circumstance or how you see the person or even how you see God. So Paul says to Timothy, apply the faith test. And we can do that too. God, I believe God the Holy Spirit is just impressing things upon our hearts now. That he's saying, what messages are you listening to? Apply the faith test. <laughs> Paul says, this is how you can know if the things you're listening to are true. Are they advancing God's work? Which is by faith. Is what you're listening to helping you or others to trust God more? Are the people, the messages who have your attention advancing their own opinion, their own fame, their own wealth, their own status, or they're feeding a lie that you're believing? Are the messages that you're listening to painting a picture of the Bible that it's boring, irrelevant and untrue? Because it's not. What about critical and complaining things that you're listening to about Jesus' church? Is that growing your faith? Has what has grabbed your attention spiralled out of control to become a life-controlling issue? Is who you are listening to leaving you feeling confused or discouraged or fearful? Are you finding yourself fighting with others in person or online, mostly about ideas? Paul says to Timothy, they don't help God's work move forward. They're not based on faith. They're not stimulating faith. They're not moving you towards a deeper relationship with Jesus. (laughs) And so if you're not sure, ask the Holy Spirit. Dig into God's word. What does he say about what you set before your eyes? What does he say about what you're listening to? What does he say about fear or gossip? Ask someone wiser. It's good to ask someone who you see God's character. And do you think I'm listening to not good messages at the moment? As the Holy Spirit helps you notice something that is either not feeding your faith or is distracting to your faith, own up to it. Ask for his help. Because the Holy Spirit always moves upon our conscience to lead us to Jesus. Not to accuse us, never to condemn us. Not to accuse us and never to condemn us to lead us to Jesus. Ask for his help and then cut it off. Like sometimes at the moment, I've deleted all the social media apps off my phone. So I was just finding it was wasting my time. There might be a season where you need to just disengage from some social media things. It's consuming your mind. It's consuming your heart. It's not growing your faith. And then do the opposite. Do the opposite. If you're struggling with something like fear, find all the scriptures you can on faith. If you're struggling with something like gossip, find all the scriptures you can on being encouraging and using your words to bless and not curse. If you're finding that you're struggling with temptation, find all the scriptures you can find about how Jesus is faithful and he will give you a way out when you're tempted. 
apply the faith test. And this, the last thing that, uh, the second thing I want to focus on today is that um, Paul says to Timothy, apply the love test. Is it growing your faith, but also is it helping you to love God and love others more? Because <laughs> if it's not, then it's not really something of lasting value. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Love is the purpose of my command. Love comes from a pure heart. It comes from a good sense of what is right and wrong. It comes from faith that is honest and true. Are the things you're listening to inspiring you to be more loving? Are the people or the messages who have your attention upholding the worth and the dignity of others? Or are you listening to things that put people down, that tell people that they're rubbish, that make you feel like you're self-righteous in some way? Or better than other people? I want to invite a couple of women to the front who we want to honour this morning because I just believe as they have diligently been part of our church family and chosen to continue to listen to God's encouragement to them, his message, him speaking to them, that they are applying the love test. So Cheryl Donaldson and Lindy Nesbitt, would you please both come forward? These beautiful ladies have been part of our church for a long time and we want to honour them this morning because for 10 years they have come every fortnight on a Friday to look after preschool children. And they've done it as part of our Mothers of Preschoolers program and they've done it because the love of God is in them and they've done it because they value children and want to bless them and place their hands of blessing on their heads and point them to Christ. And they've done it because hundreds of families, hundreds, non-Christian families, have come into the life of the church, had their beautiful children entrusted to women like Lindy and Cheryl, cared for them, so that mums, vulnerable mums, can have some time out, can have a program that really addresses some of the things that they're facing, how to encourage them in their mothering, how to build relationships and friendships, and then also in, in conversation, how to hear about the love of Christ. And so MOPS Australia, there's so many MOPS um, groups that happen right across the world. And it could not function without a team of dedicated carers who look after kids. So I just thought, what a better morning to honour them. Mops Australia want to give them a certificate as well. Thank you, Louise, if you could hand that up. We want to give you some flowers. And I know you don't seek attention. <laughs> we had to really twist your arm to get you to come. <laughs> We're there for you. But can we have put that scripture up on the screen, Jithin? Okay, next one. Nope. Next one. Thank you. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We remember you when we pray to our God and Father. Your work is produced by your faith. Your service is the result of your love. And your strength to continue comes from your hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? I just felt God put that in my heart. It's true about you and all of the team who serves children in the life of our church, wherever they are. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's put our hands together for them. This is the kind of timeless investment Paul is talking about, where our service is the result of our love and gratitude to God. We are filled up with his love for others. Who are you listening to? Apply the faith test and apply the love test. Do the people you listen to or the messages that have most of your attention come from a pure heart? Or is there an impure motive at work that's feeding a temptation in you to do wrong? Are you ignoring your conscience? You know that you shouldn't be listening to something, but it's just like, oh, I'll just shush that. I'll do it anyway. <laughs> is who you are listening to helping you grow healthier in how you relate to others? Or is it isolating you and drawing you away from others? Do you find yourself pretending to be good or habitually lying? These are the sorts of questions that we can ask. 
God, is it growing my faith? Is it helping me to love others? Or is there something that you want me to stop or limit the influence of so I can feed my faith and grow in my love? The Holy Spirit always moves upon our conscience to lead us to Jesus, not to accuse us, never to condemn us. He leads us to the foot of the cross and there we find a crucified Saviour, dying a death he did not deserve. It was for our sins he died, not his own. In Isaiah 53 it says, He suffered the things we should have suffered. He took on himself the pain that should have been ours. But we thought God was punishing him. We thought God was wounding him and making him suffer. But the servant was pierced because we had sinned. He was crushed because we had done evil. He was punished to make us whole again. The Lord has placed on his servant the sins of all of us. Why did he do that? Well, God loves you. <laughs> he knew we couldn't help ourselves. He knew we couldn't get to him by ourselves. And so he sent his one and only beloved son into the mess of our sinful world, into the mess of our lives. He came to show us what the Father is like. We see it in the Bible as we read the Gospels. But he came to seek and save the lost. He came to search out you and I and to save, to die on the most horrendous cross for our sin and not his own. He took the weight of punishment, God's punishment and our sin. He took it on himself so that he can offer us forgiveness, so that he can offer us eternal life, so that he can offer us friendship with God forever and ever. After he died and was buried, he rose from the dead. And that's why we're here this morning, because we worship a risen Jesus. <laughs> but I just want you to f- reflect as I close on this scripture. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 15 and 16, Paul's talking about what Jesus did in his life. And he said, if Jesus can do it for me, almost like if Jesus can do it for a dirty, rotten scoundrel like me, someone who was there when one Christian, Stephen, was martyred, one who persecuted Christians. If Jesus can do it for me, he can do it for anyone. And this is what he says. Here's a word you can take to heart and depend on. Kids, young people, grown-ups, every person in this room, here's a word you can take to heart and stake your life on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Sinners like me. Sinners like Paul. Sinners like you. I'm proof, he says, public sinner number one, (laughs) of someone who could never have made it apart from sheer mercy. How beautiful is that? None of us could ever have made it apart from sheer mercy. And now he shows me off evidence of his endless patience to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. And I want to talk to you this morning, if you've never given your life to Jesus, but you've heard about him this morning and you're thinking, you know, I want to know him personally. If God can do that in someone like Paul's life and you don't want to know my past, you might be thinking, if God can do that in his life, well, he can do that in mine. And he can. (laughs) And you might be right on the edge in terms of you don't know everything about Jesus. You've got maybe some questions about him, but you sense his presence here this morning. You know that he loves you and you want to trust in him forever. You can do that right now. We're going to pray. Kids, big kids, youth, let's all close our eyes and bow our head because this is a holy moment where we get to do business with Jesus.
Jesus, we come to you. Many of us, because we know that without your sheer mercy, we would not be in a relationship with God. And we are so grateful. And we've heard this morning about how we can not be distracted by things that try and take our eyes off you. But right now, if you're here this morning and you've never, ever opened your heart to Jesus, he's here. He's right here by the power of his Holy Spirit. Trusting in him forever is just simply opening up your heart and inviting him to come in. You can do that right now. You might want to say some words like this in your heart. Right now you can do it. He's listening. He's waiting. He'll hear. Jesus, I come to you. Thank you that you died on a cross for my sin. I know that I am a sinner and I need your mercy. And I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you're now alive and you offer me forgiveness, you offer me eternal life and I say yes with all my heart. Come into my life. Lead me by your Holy Spirit and help me to follow you. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song called Who You Say I Am, but can we stand together? Before we sing, just encourage us to continue in this attitude of prayer. And you might just want to be quiet before him as you listen to the music. What is he asking you to lay down at the foot of the cross? Is there something he's saying, you've, you've come to mind today that I've talked about, something you're listening to, something you're watching with your eyes, something you're feeding in your heart. And he's saying, I want you to bring that to me. Lay it down at the foot of the cross. Can we just close our eyes? You might want to lift your hands to the Lord. You just talk to him now. You just give it over to him now. You can tell him that you love him. You can tell him that you want to follow him. You can ask for his help. Just reach out to him this morning. He's here to help us. As we surrender to him, he gives us his power afresh to obey him. Thank you, Lord. So just wanted to talk to another group of people here. Do you know that devil means slanderer and accuser? You might have been having all these thoughts about how bad you are, how horrible you are. Well, the cross of Jesus, Jesus' blood shed for you. You don't have to listen to those lies. You put the cross of Jesus between you and your conscience even. (laughs) I know I'm a sinner, but Jesus died for me. He loves me. He's for me. He's forgiven me. You take authority over those lies because in Romans it says, who will bring any charge against God's chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died, more than that, was raised to life. He's at the right hand of God and He's also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Come on, let's declare this this morning. We are who you say we are. Thank you, Jesus.